Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV. I am always Anne Paul Woodage. I've been away in England seeing my folks for the first time in two and a half years, which is really nice. And now I've been back to get all these shows scheduled and lots of things coming up. If you've been following on Twitter and YouTube today, you'll realise I'm putting up shows thick and fast as we get through the next few weeks. Lots of stuff happening. D-Day anniversary, anniversary, 80th anniversary, the Battle of Midway, lots of stuff coming your way. But today we are beginning a first week and there'll be a second week in June of looking at battles Basically, from the German point of view, it doesn't mean we won't be talking about the Allied point of view as well, but we're kind of doing it from the direction of the Germans and what they were planning and what they were trying to achieve. And today we are off to Norway in 1940. Now, if you've been following me for a while, you'll know that that's one of those areas that I've, I'm fascinated by, although know a little, a little about. So um, I'll be happy to delve into that tonight. If you are new to the channel or if you're not new to the channel, please don't forget to like uh, the shows you watch. Please consider becoming a member. Subscribe consider becoming a patron and as always reminding you that all the information you lead, need about the show, about the media contacts, all the social media links, the book links are in the description below. So expand that bit on YouTube there and you have all the links you will need, including to those of my guests, social media accounts and their blogs and things like that. So without further ado, I'm going to bring my guest in. So Chris Sams is primarily a First World War historian, but dabbles in the Second World War, primarily naval, dabbles in aviation as well. A couple of books out, also been involved in history hack uh, shows over the years, and is, I'm delighted is, he's joining me. It's been a while since I've uh, spoken to him. It was on a history hack thing oh, about a year and a half ago. So um, good evening, Chris. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. Thanks, mate. How are you doing? Very well. So Norway, 1940. I mean, there's lots of angles we can look at. There's, you know, first or fledgling commando raids. There's, there's resistance activity. There's Nazis marching in. There's politics. But there's also quite a large naval involvement there. So, you know, when I was putting the feelers out, whatever it was, a week or so ago about this theme week and shows from a German point of view, you kind of leapt in and wanted to talk about Operation Juno. So before we actually talk about that, why was that the one you kind of plumped for? Um, Juno is one of those um, amazing operations that um, it's... It's utter chaos from start to beginning. No one really knows what the, in the German high command really knows what they're doing. They send out three warships and they're incredibly successful. Uh, they sink HMS Glorious, the aircraft carrier, uh, incredible bravery on the British side and the destroyers. But despite all the successes, Admiral Marshall gets sacked. <laughs> it's, it's a really odd, odd story. And is it because in 1940, everybody's finding their feet? I mean, the Blitzkrieg is, I guess, that the German part of that year that everybody talks about that the public image of is roaring success but actually when you scratch below the surface there were difficulties with that as well it's perhaps wasn't as per perfect as it's appeared to be and I guess you know, as we talk about it a lot on this channel when you get to 1942 is a really tricky year because both sides have had some success they've had some failures and by 44 45 it changes again but 1940 a very interesting period so um, I say you've, been, you've come prepared with a PowerPoint presentation, so you will guide me through it. Well, you can guide yourself through it, and we'll put that up on screen now. And folks, if you have questions for Chris, then please fire away. We'll kind of let him do the presentation and jump in with odd questions that are pertinent to the slides as they're up. And any kind of big ones about, you know, what would have happened if we'll do those kind of ones at the end, if that's okay with you, folks. So, um, well, you brought quite a bit, a big fan club with you today, Chris. So um, Alina, I think, has been doing her magic behind the social media. Good evening, Alina, wherever you are. I don't know whether you're in Poland or London, but good evening, Alina. Um, so, Chris, Operation Juno, uh, not to be confused with the code name for the Canadian landings in 1941. That might be by some of the Canadians here. It's got Juno in the title, and they're here anyway. Now wondering why we're talking about Norway. But anyway, over to you, Chris, to take us through this. It is problematic if you do a Google search for Juno, uh, Operation Juno images, and all you get is a beach and no cruisers. So, um, it's all right. Um, Operation Juno is uh, the final, well, the final naval sweep of um, the invasion of Norway. About uh, Operation Veserabung. I know my pronunciation is a little bit out, but uh, Veserabung has gone very, very badly for the German Navy. Uh, they are mainly the they're going to be the spear point of many of the landings but during which they've managed to suffer quite some horrific uh, losses. Namely, the one, famous one, in, which is the one I pictured, is the sinking of the heavy cruiser Blucher, on the which was in the early hours of the first day of the invasion, where she got uh, wandered into one of the fjords, heading up the fleet, and got 
destroyed by the Oscar, Oscar Borg uh, heavy guns and then torpedoed and sank with horrendous loss of life. The light cruiser Karlsruhe is uh, attacked by a British submarine, torpedoed and, uh, and has to scuttle. The Königsberg, another famous uh, story which I feel should be said more because the Royal Navy were fantastic with the fleet air arm, flew a long way out to Bergen and bombed her and managed to get most of their aircraft back. And um, especially for Alina, I left this one in. The supply ship Rio de Janeiro was sunk the day before the invasion by the Polish submarine ORP Orzel, which was very important because they actually, it was full of German soldiers who were captured by the Norwegians and they did tell the Norwegians that they would be invading the next day. Ah. But on top of all the losses, you also have some severe damage to other ships. Uh, Shahn, um, Hipper is damaged by, in battle with HMS Glowworm. Scharnhorst and Nice now are also damaged. But the big problem comes in Narvik. And Narvik is very important to, uh, to the whole invasion of Norway. It's the main reason that they're going. It's in the far north, and it's the port that the um, Norwegians get the ore from Sweden, goes into Narvik, and then either goes down the coast by boat or by um, through cross-country. The Germans need to take Narvik. So on the first day, Commodore Bonte brings in uh, 10 destroyers carrying 3,000 uh, mountain troops, or Gebrigsjäger, take out the Norwegian Defence Force ships, land the troops, provide artillery support. But they've lost one, they've only got one supply ship, oil supply ship. One of them got torpedoed on the way, and they've got another one coming at some point. So they can only refuel two ships at a time, and it takes a long time to do that. The next morning, uh, five British uh, destroyers break into the fjord, sink and damage several of his ships, kill Bonte himself. And then the following day, HMS Warspite turns up with um, the aircraft carrier HMS Furious, several more destroyers, and in the ensuing battle, the destroyers all get wiped out, all 10, 10 destroyers, which traps 3,000 mountain troops and 1,000 very wet, very tired, angry sailors in Narvik, who then come under immediate fire from the British, uh, British naval forces, then so Anglo-French soldiers land and General uh, Dietl in charge of the mountain troops has to pull back. The Germans have now lost the initiative in Narvik and there's no way easily to resupply them. So it goes back to, um, back to Berlin to try and figure out a solution. Raider is uh, Grand Admiral Raider is uh, very keen on the idea of sending the line of Bremen and Europa with 3,000 more men. There's no warships to escort them, they'll be fine. We'll just send them straight up the coast. Other naval commanders are not keen on the idea of sending two liners unescorted. <laughs> um, Hitler weirdly suggests to Dietl if it keeps going badly that it's okay to surrender or intern in Sweden which considering towards the end of the war with a not one step backwards sort of ruling and the execution of commanders who step back, it's a bit odd that in 1940, it's just like, man, cool, just don't worry about it. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's remarkable. We were just talking about that last week, you know, the, 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 how ridiculous, because I'm, I'm a Normandy guy, the Normandy camp, no step back. And yet in 1940, as I said earlier, I guess, everyone's still finding their feet, their kind of styles of command, I suppose. I mean, Hitler's been the, the the Reich leader for a, for a long you know, few years, but he's he's still uh, learning the, the ropes as a as a as a, a war leader. Yeah, at this point, he's not sort of decimated France and the Lowlands and declared himself a military genius yet. So, yeah. um, but he in this point in this scenario, he's actually willing to sacrifice four thousand German troops just to wow. go to um, say sacrifice, but in turn ultimately lose them. The other option, though, is a offensive naval sweep with the best warships he's got available. Uh, which is going to take time because uh, most of them are damaged or unavailable at this point. Which leads us to uh, Grand Admiral Raider, who is, he's been head of the Kriegsmarine for quite some time. He's a very, he'd been a staff officer in the First World War, served under um, Hipper uh, in the battle cruiser forces. But, and he's a fantastic, um, fantastically sharp and analytical mind, but he is not a, not a man manager at all. He's very bad at dealing with people. He'll say he he'll send you a letter or write send notes, but if he if he's not happy with you, he won't tell you such. He'll get someone else to do it for you. I mean, we've all had that manager, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but he he comes out with um several great quotes 
So, uh, which sound very Nazi in their style of, in the great style, in the great struggle for Germany's destiny, the Navy can only fulfill its task by showing uncompromising offensive spirit and a resolve to inflict damage to the enemy, whatever risk to itself. And if they were to suffer any losses, Germany's position at sea or on the uh, outcome of the war won't be affected, but by frequent operation, much can be gained, which is kind of a, a knee jerk against um, the First World War, where the, the popular myth is that the uh, high seas fleet spent its whole time sat in uh, Kiel and Wilhelmshaven doing absolutely nothing. It's entirely true. Um, and but I, fear, I fear there's a rabbit hole you could go down there, Chris, but we'll, we'll, we'll save I'm that. I'm going to steer away from it. Yeah, you, you, you sidestep that with reluctance, but I admire your professionalism for, 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 for moving forward. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, his head of, head of the fleet is Wilhelm Marshall, who to the second quote said, yeah, this order has not been sent out because in my opinion, its final section would not be really understood either by the senior officers or the ship's captains, as it is kind of vague and that kind of, yeah, this is what you're going to do. But because sacri if, if you sacrificed your ship, would you get in trouble? Which is what happened to the uh, captain of the Karlsruhe who uh, got in trouble, who even though he scuttled his ship, got told that he should have tried to save it. Um, so... They come up with Operation Juno, and the vessels that are going to be selected are the battleships, uh, Scharnhorst Nice now, the heavy cruiser Hipper, and what's left of the destroyers, so whatever destroyers they have available. The 10 that were destroyed in Narvik actually consisted of half the Kriegsmarine's destroyer force. So it was quite a, quite a horrendous defeat for them. And so you end up with several orders that come out. Raider says that the main thrust of the mission is to relieve Force Detail of, by effective engagement of the British naval forces and transport in the Narvik casted area. Head of Naval Operations West, Admiral Salvaka, who has been put in charge, he's been made a middle manager as such, sort of between Raider and Marshall. And he's he says that the first main objective is a surprise penetration of the And and Varg's fjords and the destruction of enemy warships and transports there encountered, as well as the beachhead installations. And then Marshall gets a further communication from the Hit from Hitler's HQ saying, also protect the troops pushing north by land uh, from any British attack on the flank or by sea as part of the Force, force Führstein, because the, they've also come up with an idea to try and rush as many troops as possible up the coast. Marshall isn't quite certain what he should be doing because he's got three different contradictory orders. Now, um, Rear Admiral Fricker of the Admiralty Chief Operations notes uh, writes a note on Salvator's orders with, "It will be within the discretion. It should be within the discretion of the fleet commander to decide his action in the light of the situation on shore and of the intelligence transmitted by Navy Group West about the naval situation in the area." Narvik casted Trondheim, ultimately saying, "It's all well and good for Salvator to come up with ideas, but you're not on the ships. Marshall is in charge of the fleet." he has to make the decision for his, his what's best with the information he has available and is in the best interest of the ships and men. Raider doesn't tell Marshall this at all. And he says, ignore Salvatore, your objectives, are, your objectives are to just head up there and do what you can. But then he trans and that also talks about uh, any targets of op uh, targets of opportunity at sea. If you run into a British convoy, sink it, go for it, go nuts, be aggressive. But he then communicates to Hitler on the 4th of June that um, the fleet's objective will be to um, against naval forces and transports in the Britain Narvik route. And if no counter, um, if no target is encountered, an air reconnaissance indicates a favourable situation within the fjords by attacking enemy shore bases and adequate forces. And that's quite important for when we come to the end as to why Marshall gets sacked. Um, Raider later writes that the Supreme Commander Marshall had, per, um, or he had personally outlined um, for the fleet commander a broad plan of action with, in which uh, a commander of adequate caliber, strength of mind could do everything. And he underlined it twice. I could only do it once, but um, so ultimately he's not really given Marshall any direction as to what they wanted them to do but at the same time he's being told you have to watch the army going up the flank you need to go into the fjords oh but if you find anything so marshall ultimately has decided i'm, I'm going to do it my way really so just to um, jump in it because i i'm primarily a ground guy bit of air 
minimal understanding of the sea. But it seems to me, you said already that they that the Kriegsmarine have lost the bulk of their destroyer force there. They've cobbled together what they have there, and they're now committing two battleships and a heavy cruiser to this. So this, this is they're doubling down effectively after what has been a, a bad time for them there. So they're putting in a pretty much all they've got available in that area into this. And it seems to me if that was a ground force, you'd want to have very precise orders for that because at that risk level, at least be clear what it is specifically you are trying to achieve. This sounds to me more like a kind of a luck when you've got plenty of vessels and a big ocean. Oh yeah, go out there, have fun, kill, you know, sink enemy ships, do stuff. It, it seems a bit paradoxical. This, but, you know, you're, you're putting all your force in, but you're not really giving them a specific order. Am I misinterpreting that, or is that? Or am I getting it right? Now that's kind of what I got from it as well. There, there seems to be quite a bit of confusion, and Raider hasn't hasn't been specific. He doesn't want to step on anyone's toes, and he's keeping it very, very broad. Um, bearing in mind that the Royal Navy massively outnumber anything the Germans have, even before yeah. before Norway. I mean, uh, even the, the, the Polish Navy gave, gave them some problems uh, during uh, the Baltic campaign in 39. So the Royal Navy is going to could decimate them but raider also sees it as a possibility for the navy to prove its prove its mark there's that feeling that they didn't do enough in the first world war and damn it this time we're gonna we're gonna do something the surface fleet is gonna show what it can do and so there's that kind of go out destroy be 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 aggressive kind of that sort of third reich nazi be aggressive um fortune favors the bold be aggressive yeah. Um, the, the, the ride of the Valkyries, kind of Wagnerian, kind of just launch in, kind of heads down cavalry charge, kind of, and, and which, to be fair, can and history has shown has worked for various armies and navies over the years. Yeah, that kind of just go in hell for leather. It, it can be a very convincing tactic. So it, it's just, it's just interesting. I'm, I'm glad you're giving this this understand of the command behind it because um, it, it it's it's just fascinating. Yeah, and it just gets more and more muddied. I mean, we've got this idea that uh, well, there's this kind of fake idea that the Nazi Germany is very ordered and the order comes from the top all the way down. But in reality, it doesn't matter which department uh, you look at, it's just a confused model of competing people. And it's just, I, it's, they, no one seems to know what they're doing at any given time. And it's amazing they managed to get what they did get in a way. And the Navy, the Navy apparently is no different. Right. Um, so handily here are the maps. Um, yeah. map, uh, the map on the left, I don't know why I'm pointing, you can't see. <laughs> uh, Narvik is up there in the top right-hand corner of the left-hand map. And so that's where ultimately the, the German fleet are going to be heading to. It's a long, old way. And um, thankfully at this point, well, they're not using Enigma. They, they travel under radio silence anyway because they're traveling together. But there's no Enigma alerts. And so actually no one knows they're coming. Uh, so as they as they head out on the seventh of June, they stop uh, about on the map where it says Hipper and four destroyers. They usually they're, they're usually about they stopped about there. So I said that the, the the Enigma signals weren't being read. The Germans, however, were listening to the British signals, and they knew where the British ships were. Uh, they'd actually mastered apparently they'd mastered this quite early in the war, and so. Um, one of the head signals officer came to Marshall and said, he's got some really good news. Uh, the British had signaled that they had uh, seen a raid, an unknown ship, which they presumed was a German surface raider off heading towards Iceland and HMS Renown and Repulse, the only two ships who could really be of a danger to Scharnhorst and Nice now with the destroyer escort had now, were now heading towards Iceland. They'd also managed to pick up signals from um, HMS um, Ark Royal, Glorious, Southampton, Devonshire, and Valiant. They were still around the Narvik area. So they were prepared that they were going to be heading into, into a, a possible storm. But fatally, the air reconnaissance reports hadn't come back to say what, what was going on in the fjords. Marshall wasn't too happy about this. Um, as you can see from the, the map on the right, the fjords are quite small and winding. And if you're going to take a battleship in there, you've really got to know what you're doing because you might end up like the Blucher. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a have a meeting of all the commanders aboard Nice now. And Admiral Schmunt, the second in command, says is expressing concern to Marshall 
who says, and Marshall responds with, you can rest assured that I shall not be sending the ships on any senseless foray. And he would later write in his report, we had to reckon, on, reckon with mines, net barrages, torpedo batteries, artillery emplacements, uh, knew little of where they might be encountered, as we did about uh, positions of the enemy dis disembarkation points, troop concentrations and supply depots. Ultimately, he'd be sending his ships into the unknown. You, you get your pr props snared on a torpedo net, you sail onto a minefield, sail over a submarine. I mean, HMS Warspite was lucky. She, When they attacked in Narvik, there were several German destroy um, submarines that uh, opened fire with torpedoes. But the German torpedoes were faulty. The, there'd been a massive problem with magnets. And so they all misfired. Otherwise, Warspite could have uh, ended her career in Narvik. But Marshall wasn't keen on doing that. However, towards the end of the meeting, he, his signals officer comes rushing in and says, sir, we've got an update from six hours ago. It's taken because the, the messages came, went to Berlin, back to Norway, then up to uh, Nice now. And so six hours late they hear that the radio traffic of the British ships is now leaving Norwegian waters. And what they didn't realise was that, obviously at this time, um, Dunkirk is underway. The Allies are pulling back. And so suddenly not, the, the Allies have said, well, we can't hold Narvik either. We might as well pull out of there as well. And so suddenly uh, Marshall's greeted by the fact that there may not be any British shipping in Narvik. Just as he's about to go to bed, 10.30 at night, another officer comes rushing up to him with a fresh report from the Luftwaffe. They've finally been able to do air reconnaissance. The weather had cleared. Two, bo two bombers had gone in to lay mines in the fjord, and they had been open fired on by one gunboat. So Marshall immediately believes that's it. If there's only one gunboat firing at them, where's all the other ships? What's the point in going into going into the fjords? We're not going to find any, anyone there. And he famously said that to go into the fjords, he might as well be punching the air. Uh, so the next best thing is let's try and catch British shipping as it's trying to escape, which fits into the original order for targets of opportunity and working the area between Narvik and Britain. So before I go much further, I'm not going to go into biographies of the ships because I'll lose everyone. <laughs> but um, the main main battleships of his main ships of his force are Scharnhorst and Nisnow. Uh, they are battleships. Uh, there is a debate between whether they're battleships or battle cruisers. I'm in the battleships camp mainly because if the Kriegsmarine can list them as schlag schiffer, then I'm happy for them to be schlag schiffer or battleships. Um, top speed 31 knots, pretty fast. Uh, they've got uh, they they were due to be up have their guns upgraded, but that never happened happens. But they've still got nine 11 inch uh, guns for, as their main batteries. As armor's pretty pretty impressive. The next ship down is the Hipper, which is a heavy cruiser. Her, she is the sister of Blucher, who met that untimely fate, and more fam her more famous sister, Prince Eugen, who I'm sure many people who've noticed about the German Navy will have heard of her. Um, she's a little bit smaller, a little bit faster, average guns in comparison to the other two. But between them, they're quite a sizable force for if they were to fall upon and, anyone. And just a complete bit of random trivia. As a naval historian of two wars, where are you on a ship that is named after a male still being a she? You just said the Prince Eugen there, because that's one that, you know, we universe, I had this discussion with, with Kate Jameson back when she did a Navy show, it, it, you know, uh, ships are generally her, or in Alina's case, boats are normally her. Teasing <laughs> Alina there, but when it's got a male name, how does that what 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 does that do to your brain? How do you how do you resolve that one? Um, like many things, um, I just accept it. Yeah, okay, <laughs> it's 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 like accepting trans, isn't it? It's just yeah, you know, a ship can be identic self identify as whatever it wants, and if it has yeah. a name, Prince Eugen, but wants to be a she, that's absolutely. There'll be a there'll be a date when we do naval shows with announcing the ship's preferred pronouns, and that's fine. That's <laughs> absolutely fine. And Prince Eugen refer prefers to be referred as. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I just wondered what your take was on that. It's just it's these interesting naval traditions and hangovers that male name, female re referencing it being a female. Fa fascinating stuff. Uh, absolutely. All, all three ships, all three of his main ships, or in fact, even the destroyers who I, I haven't named, are all named after um, famous Germans. So yeah. they're all men. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's just just tradition, I guess. And, um, apart from what Raider said about the British being steeped in uh, naval tradition and not being able to evolve, I well, you, got to accept the tradition, really. So that the next morning, he gets a fresh order from Salvata saying uh, to the commander at sea, failing receipt here of adequate reasons to, for attacks on convoys, proceed with main assignment, Harstead. Marshall takes that takes that and thinks, mm, no, I don't see the point in, in, in attacking the fjords. There's nothing there. We know there's nothing there. I can hit something out in the open. And I tend to side with Marshall on this because I, with well, my fascination with Von Spey as well, the, the Admiral on the spot is in charge of the fleet. He makes a decision. Salvachter is sat back in Wilhelmshaven. He's got no clue about what's going on at sea. He doesn't know what Marshall knows. Unless he's got something good to bring to the party, he should just pipe down and let Marshall, Marshall carry on. Um, so they start looking for um, they start looking for ships. They launch their Arado 196 um, float planes and they come across the Norwegian um, oil tanker, the SS Pioneer which is being escorted by the British trawler uh, Juniper. Hipper goes to engage with the destroyers. Juniper sends out a message saying, uh, yeah, unknown vessel, can you identify yourself? The Nice now responds with, yeah, HMS Southampton, and then fires 28, um, fires off her main armament and sinks Juniper. They, pick, they stop, pick up the survivors. The oil pioneer is set on, um, bursts into flames and sinks. A couple of hours later, they spot the uh, 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 the hospital ship Atlantis and the troop ship Arama, which is thankfully for the Arama empty of troops. Um, this is her sinking. The Germans call for them to surrender, they take the crew off, sink the Arama. The Atlantis they can't touch because it's a hospital ship, and the rules of war are pretty clear: you don't sink hospital ships. U-boats might, surface ships shouldn't. Um, but the trade-off on that is Atlantis isn't allowed to communicate that she has spotted German warships by radio. Right. Because she's neutral. In theory, she's neutral. However, if she comes across a British ship, she can report it then. So it's not they don't report that they have seen Marshall's fleet until the next day when they run into HMS Valiant. But by that point, as we'll see, it's going to be a bit too late. In the middle of the sinking of Arama, Salvokta sends another message. Uh, convoy attack should be delegated to the Hipper and the destroyers for further further target Trondheim. Your main objective remains Harstead. Marshall is beside himself by this point, and he said, um, I could hardly be expected to act against my own judgment and was prepared to answer to my decision before a court-martial. He is so adamant that what he is doing is the right thing to do. Then there comes a bit of a farcical moment where one of the, the Hipper's Arado spots um, two large cruisers, some destroyers, gives the uh, Germans the uh, gives Marshall's fleet the coordinates, and the Germans go heading off south looking for them. Three hours later, they realise they're looking for themselves, and so turn around. <laughs> Thought I'd leave that in; it's quite funny. Um, but at this point. The destroyers are starting to run out of fuel. Marshall is, although he has a, an oiling ship with him, he's not keen on refueling at sea because it takes time and they're vulnerable. And if they do run into a British submarine or a British patrol, they're all going to be sat around doing nothing, absolutely vulnerable. And remember, the RAF has also got quite a lot of um, air cover over this area. And it's just, if you keep moving, you should be fine. So he dis he dispatches Hipper and the destroyers to Trondheim with the added bonus that when they get to Trondheim, they can then support Fuhrerstein's advance up the coast. So again, he's fulfilling yet another part of his orders. I'm just going to remember the question from Ian Carr, because I know that it's we're, you've kind of half covered it, I think, but Ian is one of our residents of naval um, experts. who's saying, why two separate forces, the Scharnhurst and then the, the Hipper separate? Although... Were they together and then they split? Yeah, yeah, sorry. They, they, they all left uh, German waters together um, and they, they sent Hipper in to uh, attack the Pioneer first whilst Sean Austin Knight, because she was that little bit faster. Sean Austin Knight now then turned up afterwards. But they, they do split after the uh, after the chase of themselves. 
Okay. Just to um to sort of spread what they've got. So it's a speed issue as well. Okay, super. Right. Back to you. Okay, so I have to get to have a timeline of the battle. So they from their signals, they've managed to detect that there is a British convoy further to the north. So they pick up their Arados and start heading north. At uh, quarter to five, um, this is all in German time. Uh, so quarter to five in the afternoon, midship, midshipman Goss aboard the Scharnhorst, which is leading, spots a very thin ribbon of smoke on the horizon, checks with the uh, rangefinders and confirms that it is definitely a ship. So the crew start to get quite excited. Like, oh, yeah, we found something brilliant. By 1702, they call for action um, action stations. One of the uh, chief of staffs asks Marshall, what should we do if it's a battleship, sir? And Marshall just shrugs and says, well, we'll attack it anyway. So he's got he's carrying out his aggressive orders. Um, 1706, they spot they uh, they get a better idea of what kind of vessel it is. And the chief gunnery officer aboard Scharnhorst, um, uh, Wolf Lovish, sorry, my pronunciation is a bit dicey, uh, who's up in the um, gun uh, range finders in the, on, aloft says uh, that she has a thick funnel and mast with turret, probably also a flight deck. He then suggests that it's HMS Ark Royal. It's not, it's actually HMS Glorious, but still a, an aircraft carrier. She mm. is heading for Scapa Flow with uh, two destroyers, Escort, Ardent and Acasta. 1715, the Glorious uh, finally sees them and turns away. Doesn't have any aircraft up, which they should have had, really, spotting. But the commander of the of Glorious thinks, it's all right, we can probably try and outrun them. He can't. He's, by, the, by the fact that they've already seen him, they're, they're, they're closing. So they change course. The Germans, by 20 past five, change course to pursue. 1732, Scharnhorst is ordered to fire, at, and the range is 26 kilometres at this point. So the Anton and Bruno turrets, the front two, are at maximum elevation, and they open fire. 52 seconds later, they hit the water. They barely miss Glorious. And squadron leader Kenneth Cross of 46 Squadron, the Hurricane Squadron, happened to be on the deck of Glorious. And he said, um, as I looked at them, I saw flashes. In a few seconds, a few plumes of water came up just a few yards from where we were standing. It was, considering that the Germans were virtually out of sight, all you could see was the smoke was a remarkable first salvo. The German gunners get their eye in and then they, they start to bring the shells down on top of Glorious. Uh, the Admiral Marshall spots through the rangefinders that the, the, the British are actually trying to get aircraft ready on the deck. Unfortunately, the second salvo goes through them destroys them through the flight deck into the into the aircraft hangar where the very flammable hurricanes do what they do best burst into flames they can no longer get torpedoes out of the magazine because there are burning hurricanes in the way um glorious calls for help the germans aren't able to, to jam it in time but the third salvo takes out the wireless transmitter so they can only use their auxiliary which they try to do but nice now blocks it the only ship anywhere near them anyway is HMS Devonshire, who was carrying the uh, Norwegian Royal Family and Gold Reserves. There's quite a bit of debate as to whether they actually received the SOS or not. But either way, they were under strict instructions not to, not so to get involved. Not, not interfere. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've only got Glorious and her two destroyers. Um, I'm going to do the Glorious and then the destroyers, although they kind of intermit the battle will intermesh. Yeah, just, 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 just to pad the back pedal a bit, Tim, uh, pedal a bit. Tim Samson is asking, is there, a, is there a reason why they didn't have any scout planes up or is it just an oversight? Um, yeah, it was really an oversight. Um, De it's, it's kind of interesting in a way he says, but, uh, the oily Hughes was a, had been a submariner in the first world war. He wasn't really a surface commander. Marshall had been a U-boat commander in the first world war and had another commanded surface ships before the Reichsmarine. And Salvachter was also a U-boat commander from the First World War, but they'd adapted, whereas Doyle Hughes, he was, I, if I remember correctly, he was trying to get back to Scapa Flow because he wanted to get to his previous first officer's disciplinary, which he was trying, and so he was decided to rush. There was a theory that had um, Glorious turned into the wind, 
and launched aircraft straight away, it could have made a difference. But the problem is the Germans were coming from the wind, so you would have had to turn towards them, uh, which, so he thought that, you know, running, he might be able to get away from it and right, signal. Okay. okay. But yeah, it was quite, quite a bit of an oversight. Um, so, spoiler alert. Um, so as the, the shells start coming down quite heavily and uh, Glorious starts to burn, she still tries to get away. But uh, one of Sean uh, before before the end, I mean, it, it basically it was murder in a way because there's not nothing Glorious can do to to defend herself. But at this point, and the German the the two German battleships are just laying shells down and on, getting closer and closer. And one of Sean officers said that the glow of the fire was to be seen in the Glorious. Slowly, the giant began to turn on her side, pouring out flames and smoke. She drifted with the wind. A moment later, she sank. Um, it used to be on YouTube. I don't know if it is now, but they every now and then it pops up. You can see the Wochenschau. There was German newsreel aboard Scharnhorst at the time, and there is a Wochenschau episode of this battle, and it's 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 kind of interesting because you get to see all the guns going off and all the shells mounting up. I mean, Scharnhorst fired two hundred twelve shells on her own, but then you see this. This is actually a still from from that episode from the episode and knowing that only a handful of them survive it's it's like looking at the barroom footage when mm. she blows up it's it's quite tragic but and we had a question from andreas there uh, just for those who, who aren't as hot on the naval side of things glorious in terms of its size how does it compare to sort of the us and japanese character car carriers people are kind of familiar with um Roughly very... speaking you know i don't need exact <laughs> <laughs> measurements but you know is it a medium one or a large one um, you see, the, it's not the smallest. I mean, Glorious had been a, a battle cruiser ordered in the First World War, but then converted, like her sisters. Um, so she's not not particularly small. She's like some of the older Japanese version of ones that were old battleships that have been converted. Right. Um, it was big enough to do what they need, what the the air the what they needed to at the time. But then when you look at the bigger American fleet carriers, the they get open ones. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, okay. That makes yeah. sense. Um, so the battle, the other part of the battle is the uh, is the destroyers. Uh, Arden and Acasta are completely outclassed. There is nothing they can do against the the German warships, except for um, lay fog. Now, they, like I said, they get into the battle at half past five. Glorious finally sinks at seven o'clock, uh, of which there are only forty three survivors picked up the next day. Um, now, the reason for why it took so long for Glorious to sink. Was because Arden and Acasta lay down a smoke, a really effective smoke screen. So the Germans are forced to only engage what they can see, which is every now and then one of the destroyers will pop out the smoke screen, fire off its 4.7 inch guns, which are not going to do anything to the battleships. Um, maybe try and attempt a torpedo run, but then have to faint back into the smoke. Eventually, the smoke screen fades, and um, the Acasta tries to run at the at the at the German battleships but is completely outclassed, completely destroyed, and rolls over and explodes. Uh, that was the Ardent, sorry. The Acasta makes a, a last-ditch torpedo run, and it actually pays off. They put, uh, they make a full run at, towards Scharnhorst, and Captain Hoffman sees them coming and thinks, okay, they're going to do a torpedo run. We'll alter course so any, and keep an eye out for torpedoes in the water. They don't see any. I'm like, oh, okay, so no problem. They turned back onto course, believing that where the British launched their torpedoes was too far out of range. They then get hit, which is this damage here on the right. Uh, the only survive, the only survivor from HMS Acasta, as she not long after this was again blew up under the sheer volley of German fire, said, uh, "I'll never forget the cheer that went up on the port bow of one of the ships. A yellow flash and a great column of smoke and water shot up from her." We knew we had hit. She took 2,500 tonnes of water on board. So the blast was so heavy, it actually knocked men off the turrets. 48 sailors were killed. And water. Um, there was an oil tank that suddenly got filled with water, thus ruining the oil, flooded some of the compartments, and uh, reduced Scharnhorst to 20 knots from 30. So this is quite a nasty knock for the, for the um, Marshal's fleet, because you can only go as fast as your slowest ship. Of course, yeah. Now, uh, there's quite a bit of control. 
doesn't stop for survivors. Blee, it's a bad that he should have stopped. But at the same time, he has to think about the lives of his men and his ships. And there is a concern that some of those British messages, some of the some of uh, Glorious's messages had got out. And if Shan Horse is damaged and she's only doing 20 knots, it's time to get the hell out of there. Um, if you stop and start picking up survivors, you could be there for a couple of hours. And if the British home fleet turn up, <laughs> it's, it, um, it's, it's not worth, that sounds awful, but it's not worth the lives you'd save for the lives you'd lose. So Marshall leaves, quits the area. That same day, uh, General Dietl in Narvik looks out and realises there aren't any British or French troops there anymore. So he signals to Berlin, we're all good. We've retaken Narvik. Marshall heads back to uh, Trondheim to uh, get Shan Horse repaired. This is where it all gets quite catty and petty. Um, Raider comes out and says that the main primary thing was that a thrust against Harstead in the situation was prevailed could hardly have failed to be successful. Though our Admiralty could not be aware of the enemy's total evacuation, Fortune favours the bold and com competent. And he basically said to Marshall, why did you not press the advantage? You should have gone into the fjords. Why did you not? And Marshall said, but it, it, it was tried to defend himself. Raider then says that basically the sinking of Glorious wasn't a great event. It was target practice. And that um, there was no glory in it at all. And what he, he, he has endangered his ships. He has damaged, he's damaged Scharnhorst. Mm. His fleet here in Raider's eyes, the German fleet should have been whipping around the um, Arctic Ocean, sinking British ships left, right, and centre. And yet Marshall's come back with one damaged warship, shrugging his shoulders, going, "Well, we've got well, we've got an aircraft carrier." But what Marshall did was what he was supposed to do. Um, Marshall then he also Raider also says uh, that the main point is. Uh, Mar M. Marshall lacked the strength of purpose and of a great leader. Consequently, as an uh, operational uh, commander, he was generally speaking a failure. He also said to Marshall that, as supreme leader, supreme supreme leader, I get to uh, make the decisions of how my men conduct themselves and how they how the war is fought, and not you. And if I do give criticism, you shouldn't take it as an insult. But then he later he also turns around and says that he's a failure. Uh, Sal Vokter also complained because he checked with Berlin and being told that the orders he had was absolutely right as well and that Marshall should have gone on to Harstead. And ultimately, Marshall just went on the sick list. He said, you know what? I'm not dealing with this. I'm sick. And so he put himself on the sick list. He was immediately replaced by Lutjens of Bismarck fame. Lutjens... <clears throat> Luchens then decides that he's going to go on the offensive. And on the uh, 10th of June, so just literally two days later, he takes out Nisnau and Hipper on an operation. They, The next day, they run into HMS Clyde, who puts a torpedo into Nisnau, causing this damage here in the on the right. So Marshall was probably right to come back to Trondheim because the British, on the same day, on the 9th, the day after the Glorious Sank, Valiant runs into the Atlantis, who says there are German warships cruising the area, and they start looking for them, especially with the loss of Glorious as well, you know what the British are like for vengeance. And so, yeah. again, Marshall, Marshall made, probably made the right call. He was late, he would later replace Salvoctor as head of Marine Commando Vest, and uh, when asked, do, do you think this is a, a case of Raider admitting that maybe he made a mistake and maybe he was wrong? He came out with this uh, with this closing quote, which I, I absolutely love. Is he would rather have bitten his own tongue out than to admit it. Mm. I mean, yeah, this this that there's two clearly two elements to this story. There's the actual action on the seas of ships engaging each other. We can come back and talk about the the, the range of those first shots because correct me if I'm wrong. They're about the the furthest shots. That actually hit it, it, kind of in 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 World War Two. I mean, certainly up there in the top five. So, and then there's this pettiness of command structures, things like that. And and you know, where, and does this have? A, we'll do the we'll do the command issue first. Do, you've, you've already hinted at the fact it has that immediate effect. Luchens goes out and does his thing. But 
where does this leave surface vessels in terms of how they're commanded for the rest of the war? Because we talked before going online, folks, you know, U-boats get a lot of attention. And then when the, the surface vessels come in, it's often Bismarck is kind of the big one everyone talks about. But you, you know, you studied both wars. Some of these characters who said they're involved in both wars, they learn their trade in the first and then and then move on to higher command in the second. So what's the legacy of this? What do the what do the Kriegsmarine learn from this and what do they not learn from this in terms of command? Um well the not much, I don't think, really, because they go on to have some very successful operations. Uh they the one that never really gets talked about is Operation Berlin. Uh, Scharnhorst and Neisnau under Lutjens escape into the Atlantic and they start carrying out operations against British shipping uh, of mixed success. They don't get sunk, so I suppose that is a success, and then fall back to Brest. And then the mint, when you get the uh, Bismarck operation, Scharnhorst and Neisnau were meant to eventually go out and meet them. And it, the, uh, the idea was that Bismarck, Scharnhorst, Neisnau and Prince Eugen would be operating the Atlantic and prowling around. But they hadn't really learned anything from them. This is my bugbear because I, I do cruiser warfare in the First World War and about warships interdicting um, trade, trade ships. It doesn't work as a concept because warships require, <laughs> require so much uh, maintenance and if you run out of ammunition or if you get damaged, you're so far away from your home bases, you're not going to get repaired. You can only intern yourself. It would look like Graf Spey at the Battle of the River yeah, Plate. Yeah. She was absolutely screwed. If that had been in the North Sea, she might have been able to make a run for, for Germany or get back up. But she's so far away that they're not going to get anything. And it would have been the same for um, the German fleet if it had been operating from Brest, if they got caught out in the middle of the Atlantic. The British, well, again, this is what happens to Bismarck. The British just get her between two different fleets. They're just going to destroy her. Um, but they, they continue this idea of aggressive surface vessel warfare and the warships pay for pay the same attrition, um, especially like sitting in Brest where they're trying to get repaired and the RAF just bomb it for, for years. Mm. And then you get Operation Cerberus. You also get more operations off uh, nor the northern coast of nor Norway and even into the Arctic. The they launched two surface raids, uh, Operation Wunderland under Schmidt is one of the, is the more successful one, into the Arctic Circle to interdict Russian trade. And they try to be as aggressive as possible, but it's... I hate to say it, but they probably would have been better concentrating on U-boats. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, for that. I wasn't expecting that from you, Chris. That was a, that was a, that was a God, left, left field one for me there, but it, it is interesting. But so... So let, that's a little bit about some of the figures and, and some of, you know, Sean Brennan remind us, if we think the German admirals are, are petty, he's reminding us, as you said there, the um, the, the, the possible reason for the, the no spotting aircraft is the commanders rushing back for to court martial. So so British co commanders clearly could be equally petty about careers and reputations and, and rivalry. So, and we know the same applies to the Japanese Navy and it does the Italian Navy definitely. And I guess the US Navy as well and, and probably all the other ones as well. So, personalities and, and and rivalries is a main thing but the the actual naval engagement aspect of it because you, you you kind of casually dropped in the fact that this is happening beginning just as as operation dynamo the evacuation from dunkirk is kind of reaching its its climax and it's happening just after so in the press back in 1940 this is this is second page rather than first page because of because of the dynamo is a better news story in the sense of you've you've Pulled, we're winning something yeah pulled a victory out of, out of the jaws of defeat there so but this yeah the, the range that the elevation of those guns when they first when they first engage is remarkable and the accuracy of that gunfire is also remarkable so where does it sit in you know the top 10 naval battles of, of the first and second world wars i mean and i mean in terms of to your particular importance not where the public perception of is where, where do you kind of put it up classify it oh uh for the Second World War, for me, for the being a German, primarily German Navy, I I rate it possibly the highest. I mean, there's wow. not much in the way of gunnery because it's just two battleships versus an aircraft carrier, yeah. and you probably get probably say the Battle of uh, Denmark Strait and the sinking of HMS Hood, and then sinking the Bismarck. But I tire of Bismarck. Everyone always goes on about Bismarck and Tirpitz, and I personally, I I'm, I've always preferred the underdogs, uh, the, the the lesser stories. And so for me, Bismarck's great. It gets all the attention, gets all the girls, but Sean Horst and Nice now firing at Glorious is, is much more interesting story, because, probably because it's slightly more unheard of and unknown. Um, other battles, 
Cape Matapan is quite a good one. Um, yep. I, also, I also quite like the Japanese incursion into the Indian Sea, Indian Ocean. That's quite quite a good one. Um, uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's really small scale compared to a lot of battles. You know, if you look, especially when you look at the Pacific. But for 19, 1940, this by this point in the war, this is the the biggest and most devastating um, bat loss for the Royal Navy, and I yeah, think will no, be for definitely. some time. And, and you know, this is the th it's turned up so often on World War Two TV is is timing of things and the need for the public to have a good story that follows a bad story. You know, again, this goes back to Rourke's Drift following Isandwana. You know, that kind of thing. You know, we, we let's let's not have follow up a disaster with another disaster let's always try and bring something there and so the reason that we are debating some battles 70 nearly 80 years or well 80 years on for 42 battles is because some of them are just were more talked about then and they're more talked about now and and you know there was that series on Bismarck just a couple of weeks ago wasn't it Ian Ballantyne was involved in that and we were talking about we talked about how publishing works, and there are certain titles and Dam Busters and Market Garden and D Day and Bismarck and Midway and Pearl Harbor that will just always bring draw people in, and you know um, some of the ships involved in this, you know that that they're not as well known. They don't roll off the tongue in the same way, and 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 Absolutely. that's because of the public perception, I suppose, really. So. Um, any questions from the viewers? Are there's nothing come much come in recently? Uh, although you did say about the U-boats maybe being a better a better <laughs> option for the Germans there. But other thing is, you know, you're talking about the um the fact this is less well known. Is there um are there are you know obviously you've you've told us a story from the commander's point of view and then some of those vessels only a few people survived. Is there is there data out there? Is there archives out there to to look at to to tell this story in in wider detail if we want to? Um, yeah, I mean, originally I, I wrote this article uh, a while back, a few, a few years ago, and uh, there are a couple of the uh, quote I got from the RA, RAF officer whose name I've already forgotten, Kenneth Cross, and the uh, leading seaman. I believe I got those from the sound archive at the IWM uh, back when I was listening to those. There are there, there are books on it, that, um, and Norway, there, Norway is, is a bit more of a, an opening subject. More and more people are getting more interested in it. Uh, unfortunately, my Kriegs Marine section, my library is just this bit. <laughs> it's not that much of it. Um, well, it's, it's bigger than mine. So, um, <laughs> bigger than my Kriegs Marine. And, um, so yeah, I mean, I just got a question there from Keith Allen saying about the technology. We, you talked about the you know the the, the gunnery there. Uh, did they have the benefit of radar guided gunnery at this stage? I don't believe they did at this point. I could be wrong. Um, I, I'm I'm never any good with the tech side of it of naval history. Um, I can never look at a ship and go, oh, I know what that is. And, but uh, I mean, Drakenfell for that. He's he's the tech man, isn't he? But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm more personalities and battles. When it gets to the tech stuff, I get a bit. But um, I'm pretty sure that it was because uh, they were all do they were doing it through the range finders. I have a feeling that at this point that they weren't that well, there wasn't the radar control gunnery. But I'm absolutely willing to be completely contradicted. I, I'm okay. <laughs> that we'll do that. They just. Um, there's, there's nothing else particularly coming in terms of comments other than the fact people are liking it and there's you know the, the interesting debates about personalities and and these these um differences of opinion within german high command these problems don't go away they just get worse and worse as the war goes on and the and the buck passing and the blame uh, um to other people just continues and it continues after the war as well so um uh, one question from Johnny Doyle there. Were there any Norwegian uh, vessels involved in this? Or are they all uh, the ones left? Have they all gone to the UK? Um, the only Norwegian vessel that was involved was the uh, Oil Pioneer, which was uh, the Norwegian um, oil, tran uh, oil transport, which they, they sank. There were, other, there were other Norwegian ships leaving. Uh, the two that had been in Narvik when Bonti arrived, he promptly sank. So um, I think by this point, most of the Norwegian ships that could escape had escaped because uh, by this point, the, the campaign definitely in the south of Norway was pretty much over. So the, um, pretty much everyone that had, could escape had escaped. There was involved by three Polish destroyers, though. They had been in Narvik shelling the uh, German positions. So, you know, the Poles were there. Uh, yeah, yeah, Alina will be pleased. Um, yeah, that's and what I you know, we, we talked about before going online. I mean, there are lots of what ifs. Dr. Alexander Clark had a discussion with him when we talked about Narvik a year or so ago about all the the variables. You know, people talk about what would have happened if I don't know Operation Torch had failed or Malta had fallen in 1942 or something. But there are a lot of scenarios. The even kind of an amateur armchair historian can kind of play out in Norway in 1940 that 
steer things very, very differently. You know, you, you know, we talked about the importance of that fish oil from the Lofoten Islands, and and you're talking about the other things coming out of there. Then later on, there's heavy water in Norway. So there's there's various ways of looking at that 1940 era and saying if that had gone this way, if the British had done this, if the French had done that, if the Norwegians, the Germans had done this. It's an interesting, um, yeah, a, a theoretical battlefield. So anything that you've kind of thought of about in that era that you think that this, this is the one thing you think of is if only so-and-so had done that, that might have led to, or, or is it just something you kind of toss ideas about that really kind of firm conclusions? I, I think that had the Bridget, had the Allies been able to hold on to Narvik, there wasn't, I mean, the Germans were trying to fly in supplies, but that wasn't really happening. Feuerstein's obviously trying to march up to it. And then obviously if... If Juno had failed, if they'd have gone into the and the British had held on, the effect on German ore production might have been could have had a real taken a real hit because they had to get the ore through to Germany. Otherwise, you haven't got a war machine. Yeah. Um, and if you if they'd have then done what they did in the First World War and put submarines properly in the Baltic for any other traffic from coming from Sweden the other way, maybe they could have, the, the 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 it would have bit hard. Um, yeah. could have got the German okay. um, so. We'll just do the last question from Alina because we love Alina. So she's just saying, can you expand on the Polish involvement, Chris? So uh, um, if you want to. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the big one was the Ords I was thinking, uh, the Rio de Janeiro. Uh, they came up on, it was the day before the invasion. There was, I want to say there's about 300 German troops on it, horses, tanks, other things. Uh, they ordered them to stop. Well, the Germans refused, so they put a torpedo in her. Then when they, they then put another one in her, she sank. The Germans were uh, rescued by the Norwegians. And uh, during the interrogation, they said, oh, you know, we're, we're part of an... They were all wearing army uniforms, so you couldn't really hide it. And they said that they were part of an invasion force, uh, but Norwegian intelligence didn't really quite pick up on it. And uh, I, uh, I forget the names of the Grand Class Destroyers, one of whom is called Lightning, <laughs> I'm not going to try and pronounce it, was actually present at Narvik and had been shelling German positions. One of them, I believe, was sunk in Norwegian waters. Um, but again, I, I, I wasn't expecting it, so I haven't got the got the details yeah, on no, it. I mean, I'll put trying, it on Twitter. We're just trying to please Alina, won't we? But I think what we'll do is we'll bring things to an end because it's nice to get a nice, a nice tight show that people will catch up on later on. It'll be really good. So I'm just going to... I'm going to leave you for a second and come back and talk to you in a minute. I'm going to remind people what we've got coming up this week, and I'll come back to you in a second. So, folks, uh, we continue our look at battles from the German point of view. Tomorrow will be a, a first-time guest. Anthony Tucker-Jones is coming on to talk about his new book that is out right now, Hitler's Winter, The German Battle of the Bold. We have looked at the Battle of the Bold from the German point of view before, but there's no harm in looking at it again. Other shows this week, Claire Barrett, another first-time guest, is coming on to talk about the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain, which we've also talked about before, but you can never have more too many opinions on this subject, and she's American, so she'll bring her slant on it perhaps different to Victoria Taylor. I'm especially looking forward to the Friday show when we're talking to Steve Zaloga about what the Germans actually had at Point du Hoc here in Normandy. And then there'll be a second show in June uh, about what the Rangers did on D-Day assaulting Point du Hoc. And I trust me, if you think you know that story, and I thought I knew that story, having guided there having hundreds of times, I learned a phenomenal amount from Steve Books. So that'll be an amazing uh, show. And then Thursday, Dr. Philip Blood and Rick are joining me to talk about what the Allies or the Americans talked later on as mission command, the German concept of small unit tactics. And I'm deliberately avoiding saying the German word because I'm really bad at pronouncing it. I will have practiced it for Thursday, but I'm not going to say it yet. So I'm beginning with A, A U F, average tactics, but I'm not good at doing it yet. So, folks, again, remind you don't forget to uh, uh, subscribe, don't forget to check out what we're doing. Uh, check out Chris's books. Uh, he's written on aviation and First World War stuff. And check out his appearances on History Hack. That's all worth worth doing. Alina is also one half of History Hack. The link, in fact, History Hack. If you haven't heard of History Hack, where have you been the last two years? An amazing podcast that covers all aspects of history. Link is in the description below. But I'm going to bring Chris back in basically to say goodbye. So there we are, Chris. Um, It's been good talking to you. You've broken your World War II TV duck. Will you be happy to come back again at some point in the future and do something else? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Good. Super. So where we are then, this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow night, same time, 7pm UK time to talk about the Battle of the Bold from a German point of view. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for your attention. Bye.